What is up everybody, welcome back to another video, and in today's video, we're gonna be doing a Q&A. So it's been a while since we did one of these. I think the last time I did one was uh, probably last year, or at least earlier in the year, uh, maybe like midway. So it's been a while since then, and I uh, kind of made a community post a couple weeks ago asking about if you had any questions for me personally, and we're going to go through them all today and hopefully um, have some answers to all these questions. Um, if there are some specific questions that could be explained in further videos, like specifically musical topics or uh, maybe even business stuff, we can definitely talk about that as well. I think my path is kind of unique in, um, in, in like compared to a lot of other people's composing paths in terms of like income and what's going on. So I'll kind of discuss that a little bit as well if the need arises. But anyways, let's get into it. Let's start from the very uh, bottom or like the earliest questions to the latest ones. So here we go. Anton asks, what does a typical day or week look like for you? Well, for me, it's interesting. Like uh, the, the way I structure my week is um, my, my full-time income is es uh, essentially coming from teaching. So piano teaching, uh, theory teaching, composition teaching, whatever. And usually that is from uh, like about four in the afternoon to about eight in the evening. So I kind of chunk out my afternoons and evenings for uh, teaching purposes. And that's al also because like, I teach a bunch of kids, right? So during the day they go to school, so then they have free time in the evening, so I work in the evenings. Um, and then that means during the day I have time to make content, I can work on music, I can orchestrate, I can arrange and do other stuff that I wanna do as well. So that is how a typical day looks like for me um, during the week. On the weekends, um, my teaching days are especially busy, again, because of the schedule of students. So I tend end up teaching a lot on Saturdays actually, and on Sundays as well, um, in the morning until about mid-afternoon. Then I kind of um, help out at my parents' office. They own a dental office, so we uh, we just do a bunch of filing and, and stacking and all that type of stuff. So that's kind of my typical week. Um, he also asked, do you try to find time to write music every day? That's a great question. I think I personally, um, in, in the past month or so, I've been trying to find more time to write music, and there's no really no excuse because, um, again, I have those hours from the morning to the early afternoon to write music. So... Um, it's it's really all on me to try to find the time to do that. So in between making content and uh, you know arranging, doing freelance work, I, I am trying to write more music, and that's the whole reason why I got into it in the first place was to make music and to write songs and write orchestral pieces, right? So at the moment, at the at the time of recording this video, I'm working on a song uh, with lyrics and singing, and that's going to be really exciting because I haven't written a song in over like three years. <laughs> I've only worked on orchestral pieces, so. Um, this is a, it's kind of a venture back to my original heart for me, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. So I can't wait for you guys to hear it. It's going to be coming out um, uh, right at the top of the new year. So please keep me accountable for that, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to show it to you. Okay, moving on. Uh, Hugo asks, can you detail how you're able to get a sustainable monetary income? Specifically, for which entities do you regularly work for and get your money from? And roughly how, <clears throat> excuse me, how much is that? As someone who's now starting to make his first couple bucks from composing, I'm really curious to figure out your system. Great question. So, you know, money is always a big question with, with music. Um, like I mentioned already, like my, my regular income comes from teaching. So I teach full time and <clears throat> um, it really depends on the type of thing that you're teaching. Whereas something like teaching piano is more common and it's more competitive because there's more people doing it. You, you have to charge a little bit less compared to like if you're charging for composition or if you're charging for arranging because there are less people doing that type of thing. So my rates for composition and arrangement tend to be a little bit higher than if I'm just teaching straight piano or theory. It's a little bit different, a little bit diff different focus, if you know what I mean. So if you're working a day job currently, um, I would highly recommend you keeping that day job so you can sustain yourself and have a reliable source of income while trying to find these composing gigs and making a little bit of money from that. Um, it's it's so tempting to want to just quit our day job, especially if we don't like it, because we feel like, oh, my day job is holding me back. I, I don't have enough time to dedicate to my um, my music, but it's actually necessary to keep the full time job while you're working little steps, you know, to to building an income from music, and then eventually you can, uh, I guess, transition and pivot totally to composition if you find that the income from that is, you know, replacing or you know, it's it's adding up to or evening out at the same amount as your day job income. So 
that's a little thing that I like to keep in mind. Sean asks, um, here's a few questions. <laughs> do you use solo strings ever and which solo strings libraries do you have and like, exposed or layered? And what about voice and choir libraries? So the solo strings I personally use at the moment are Cinematic Studio solo strings. I think they have a really gorgeous romantic sound that I like to use to layer in with string ensembles, whether that's CSS or Berlin strings or whatever. Um, and yeah, it, like I don't write that much exposed string stuff at the moment, like solo string stuff. So if, if I was to do it exposed though, I might still use CSSS if it's more of that lush and um, romantic style of music. If not, I might go with something like Cremona Quartet if it's slightly more classical like I already did a video on. Um, or if I want a little more definition in the sound, I might go with like Tableau solo strings from uh, organic samples. Uh, voice choir libraries, I currently use the choirs from Metropolis Arc 1 and 2, and then um, sometimes also from Time Macro, Time Micro as well. Those have some beautiful choirs that I just use all the time. Uh, number two, do you work with synths? What are your favorite synths and why? So I rarely work with synths at the moment, being an orchestral guy, and I know nothing about sound design pretty much. So um, like I could definitely learn about it, but I just, I'm lazy about it, and I just don't really have the desire to do that. But I do have Serum, and I use that sometimes for a basic like sub line underneath everything, just, just to keep it nice and full and rich at the bottom end. Um, so that's what I do sometimes. And then there's also, I think, I think it's free, um, CineSign Light from CineSamples. It's a really cool sine wave layered in with some uh, like white noise or, or pink noise or something like that to, to keep it nice and full. Uh, what is your personal composing workflow? Do you usually compose with sketching on piano and then orchestrate, or do you like to sketch directly on orchestral instruments? Um, I typically sketch on the piano first, whether that's having full chords and then putting in the uh, melody line with that as well at the same time with the rhythm. At least that gives me a basic shell of what I want to accomplish. However, there are cases where I know that if I play it on piano, I'm gonna start hearing it in a pianistic way and then that might affect the way I orchestrate it. So uh, sometimes I'll, I'll go directly to the strings or the brass and I'll do a quick sketch using an ensemble patch, if you will, you know? And then I'll just like sketch it out really quickly there. So it really depends, but most of the time, like 80% of the time, I'll do it on a piano first, cine piano, which I do, I, I do have videos on that instrument, of course. What's your preference? about wet versus dry and sampled versus modeled virtual instruments. Um, <clears throat> I personally use wetter instruments because I love the natural ambience that instruments are recorded in. So I'm thinking specifically of cine samples and orchestral tools. Um, I don't have any Spitfire stuff. I don't have any VSL stuff. So those are kind of on opposite side that's sides of the spectrum. Spitfire being very, very wet and um, VSL being very, very dry. I like something right in the middle and that's OT and cine samples because it just makes it easier to mix together and I don't have to fiddle too much with reverb tails and all of that. I just like to start with really good source material. So for me, that's really important. And I don't use any modeled virtual instruments. I use completely sampled personally because I just think it has the most authentic sound. You know, I don't think, like for me, I've, I've heard a lot of people having trouble or at least putting in a lot of effort with sample modeling instruments to try to make them sound realistic when I think you can do very well with sampled instruments, even though the technology may not be as flexible, but the sound I think speaks for itself. Uh, what's your preferred woodwinds and brass sections configurations? Ooh, good question. Um, for woodwinds, I, pers I pretty much always use the flute and bassoon from Berlin Woodwinds. And then if I need an oboe and a clarinet, I'll usually turn to the um, expansion uh, soloists from Berlin Woodwinds as well, because those are some beautiful solo instruments in that package. But for the flute and the bassoon, I usually use the Berlin Woodwinds uh, legacy package. And yeah, I pretty much always have those in there. Um, I guess rare, like occasionally I'll have like doubles for those if, if they need a more uh, if they need a fuller texture or if I need harmonic lines in those woodwinds, but usually one is enough for me. And brass, I always have French horns, whether that's a solo horn or an ensemble patch. I usually have trumpet on, uh, trumpet ensemble, like from Cinebrass, and uh, sometimes trombone ensemble as well, and then usually a tuba, whether that's from Cinematic Studio Brass or Berlin Brass as well. Uh, favorite woodwind instrument? Yep. I actually, I, I mentioned before how the woodwinds are I like my favorite uh, orchestral section actually, because of the amount of unique colors that can come from them. And as a flute player, I love the flute, but 
in terms of actual sound, I really love the oboe because it has a it has a great range, but the sound is very full, it's very rich, and it can it it can create this really pining quality that's almost like singing, and it's really beautiful. Uh, favorite string instruments probably the cello because it, it's you know huge range, very full sound as well, and very lyrical. And favorite brass instrument probably the probably the trumpet and the horn trumpet and French horn. All right, moving on. Uh, Kieser Saucis, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, says, um, how long did it take you to be able to live from your job as a composer? Okay, so another good question. Um, right now, I, I'm making a living primarily from teaching, although I am receiving more income from freelance work and orchestration and all, all of that. I should also point out that my uh, more of my income now is coming from uh, selling my online course, Cinematic Music Creation. And if you don't know about it, um, you can just search up uh, Cinematic Music Creation on Google and you'll find it. But essentially all it is, is uh, what I'm doing now called content marketing. Basically, I'm putting myself out there, creating these, these videos for you. And if you find this material valuable, valuable then what that does is um, it allows me to give you something else even further, which is called a lead magnet. Um, usually that's a free guide. Usually I promote that at the end of a video um, and you can download that absolutely free and it gives you a quick win because it, 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 it helps you dive deeper into a specific topic, right? But then it also um, offers you a product of mine, my, my flagship product, Cinematic Music Creation. Um, and if you like that, then, um, and if you're interested in it and you purchase it, then that supports me. So that, that's how I make um, more money from the site as well. And so um, it's a combination of teaching piano and teaching, you know, full time in addition to having income from my online course, Cinematic Music Creation. So the the goal eventually is to make a living full time from um, just pre producing content and um, and uh, creating courses and resources for you. And that that's going to be um, a really exciting journey. So <clears throat> at the moment, that's how I'm making most of my income. And it's 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 fun, you know. Fun to be able to give to you freely and make money on the back end. So it's great. Cool. Um, Stan asks, Stan Harmer asks, do you have a sample pack? And if not, are you going to be releasing one? You know, I've thought about that, um, but I just don't really have an ideas of what kind of sample pack would be interesting to you guys. So if, if something like that would be interesting, um, please let me know. Um, what what you would want from me, you know, what I could potentially do for you in terms of a sample pack or MIDI MIDI pack or whatever. Um, that could that could be fun. Rafael Rosa asks, uh, how do you how do you work remotely and how do you network and what are your top tips for getting gigs online? Okay, so let's answer this first because there's a few questions here. But um, how to work remotely? So I mean, I think I think so. That's the thing. Like, I don't think you need to live in LA or. Um, you know, any like bustling place to really get work. I think you can make a pretty good living and get a lot of work um, just by being present and, and having your work out there for people to, to see. That, now, that's not to say you should spam groups, right? And that's, that's kind of the downfall of many people is that they produce content, but then they're, they're basically showing every single video, every single tutorial, every single piece of music that they make to these groups, and it just waters it down, right? And people start to think of it as spam. And that's what, you know, you don't want that. So putting your work out there is very important. And networking <clears throat> is, is, is obviously something that's very essential. So if you introduce yourself and um, ask for feedback, and if you um, open yourself up for constructive criticism, that's one way to get people into your world and, uh, you know, make friends in the industry among peers. If you're trying to present yourself to like directors or people like that, then first of all, it's really important to get your chops up and make sure you're practicing scoring to picture. You know, you can download free video clips and practice scoring to those just to make sure you're you, like, you know what you're doing, right? Um, but the way that I've personally got all my gigs orchestrating or um, freelance arranging or any of that <clears throat> has been putting my work out there on my YouTube channel. And then occasionally, sharing some tutorials in groups uh, that I think those people inside, like those members could benefit from. So for example, I'm in a, uh, a pop music group who doesn't specifically uh, specialize in orchestral music, for example. So if like I, I've shared a couple of my tutorials within that group or shared like 
one of my pieces in there, for example, and um, kind of explain the benefits of the video and like what I personally do. And then I've gotten some work from that. So people like songwriters asking me to add orchestra on top of their music, just like that, you know? So putting your work out there is very important. Like whether that's creating new music, definitely release that. Um, on whether it's YouTube channel or a SoundCloud link or wherever, but consider YouTube because it's the second largest search engine in the world. So people are most likely going to be visiting YouTube like almost every day. And the chances of them stumbling, stumbling across your piece of music is higher than if you um, didn't put it on there and only put it on something like SoundCloud, you know? You could also um, submit pieces to Audio Jungle or these, um, these non-exclusive companies where the more music you produce, the more chances you have of placing them in certain media forms. So that could also be really interesting. But yeah, for me personally, putting my stuff out there regularly on a consistent basis has allowed me to get consistent work, you know? The more I put out there, the more um, chances people have of finding me, and uh, then the more chances I have of getting hired to do specific work. Now, I don't do any film scoring. I actually don't really have that much of an interest in doing that. I think my heart is really in songwriting and composing standalone music that really speaks for itself. And um, and whether that gets picked up and used in a certain thing, that's awesome. I would love that. Uh, but I guess I just never had the real itch to score the picture personally. I think I, I just wanted, I, I just like to create music that speaks to people and it doesn't really require an a visual medium to complement that, if that makes sense. Uh, he also asks, are there more jobs for orchestrators, arrangers than for composers? Good question. I actually don't know about that. I feel like that answer might be yes, because not everyone who composes music can orchestrate, but then again, not everyone who orchestrates can compose. I, that, that I don't know about. That's a good question. Um, I guess for me personally, I, I've, I've like all of my work personally right now is for orchestrating or doing MIDI arranging. So maybe, maybe. Um, when did you get to the point where you felt ready to professional, uh, sorry, to work professionally with music? What are some signs that someone is ready for the market? Ooh, that's a good question. I think uh, a, a pretty straightforward answer is to share your work. And if you're receiving positive feedback on it, um, then you know that you're ready. And whether that's sharing that, that music with peers or even lay people, see what type of feedback you get. If people are saying like the mix is a little muddy here or it doesn't sound quite right, then you know that there are some specific things you need to work on within your specific niche, uh, within your specific genre of music, right? And you should always find like a bread and butter style. I think that just comes with writing more music. But um, if you get to a point where you're sharing your music and people are, are really, um, receiving it positively and they're experiencing it really nicely and um, you know you're receiving these comments that are very um, positive then I think that's a great sign that you're ready and even if you're not like even if you feel confident in your work then you, you might as well take the leap and start trying to charge for your work if people find what you're doing enjoy it and want to work with you then you should take that opportunity even if you're feeling nervous but if you're feeling confident I think you should just take the leap so there's no real like sudden clear sign <clears throat> when someone is ready for the industry, you know, whether that's composing or arranging or whatever. So what are your favorite books and resources for learning orchestration in theory? You can read tons of books. You can go to school for it. You can do whatever you want, but you have to listen to music. That's the biggest thing. And I, the, the way I learned orchestration uh, mainly was by listening to a lot of music and finding out colors and combinations that I personally liked. So that's how I learned most of that. For theory and arranging, oh sorry, ma mainly for theory and piano, I learned that <clears throat> as, a, as a young kid growing up, I had those lessons. You know, I had piano lessons starting from the age of five and I started theory lessons probably at seven, eight, like that. So I'm a classically trained pianist. All right, Hugo asks, I know you're running 16 gigabytes of RAM. Do you have trouble working with orchestral templates in your DAW or you don't use templates at all? If you do use templates, can you share some tricks or, uh, for how to organize them and build them in a low RAM friendly way? Great question. Um, so first of all, I run 64 gigabytes of RAM now. Now that I work on my iMac, I actually have 64 gigabytes of RAM. And so even though I do have 64 gigabytes, I actually don't work with templates that often. And if I do, 
um, the way I save RAM is by using a shell. And this is what Daniel James uses, uh, I believe, in his workflow is that he'll have tracks pre named and pre organized, like strings, violins, woodwinds, uh, sorry, violins, violas, you know, celli and basses, and then woodwinds, and then brass, and then, you know, percussion with their respective instruments, but they won't have anything loaded in them so that when you load up that template, that, that shell, then you can go into the tracks and load in the specific instruments you want to load in. So that way you save totally on RAM, but at least you have your basic structure of your template set up. Hope that makes sense. Anton says, where do you want to be in three, five, or 10 years? And what do you want, or sorry, what are you doing to achieve these goals? That's the question, isn't it? Well, you know, I would love to work for a company like Disney as a composer or arranger. And if you listen to my music, I hope you can hear there's a bit of a Disney or a Nintendo influence in there. So that's the other company I'd love to uh, do work for eventually is Nintendo or Disney. Um, it's just that like free flowing, um, like orchestral type of music that's really my favorite. And it's, it's so beautiful. It gives you those happy vibes. And I feel like that really matches my personality personally. And um, I would love to be involved with <clears throat> um, at least musicians who work with those companies. And so at the moment, I'm, I'm, you know, creating content for you. And I'd also like to create a bigger, um, or I'd like to create more music. Um, I'd like to write more pieces. I'd like to write more songs and put my work out there. So people have a better idea of what I do in terms of, you know, a, as a composer or songwriter. So that's really important for me. And that's something I definitely want to do in 2021 is write a specific number of songs or write a specific number of compositions and big band charts and whatever. That's also another thing I want to do more of is writing big band charts. Karsten says, do you mix by yourself? How did you train your mixing skills? Are you mixing with MIDI or only with audio and why and which tools to use for mixing? So mixing is a huge topic and I actually do have a mixing series, Karsten, on my channel, um, six complete parts that you can watch. But yes, I do mix by myself. And how did I train them? Well, I have to big, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Graham Cochran at The Recording Revolution. He breaks things down in a very specific and uh, simple way. So if you haven't heard of The Recording Revolution, definitely check out his channel. Um, and yeah, you learn the basics from there. So he has a really great resource there. And yeah, it's just a lot of listening and using your ear to figure out like what what doesn't sound quite as good? Is it too like hissy or is there a lot of room sound or whatever? So you learn the basics of EQ compression and reverb and um, keep things simple. Things are not supposed to be complicated. You just wanna find ways to solve your problems while keeping it simple. I mix with both MIDI and audio. Um, or I should say, or audio, it depends on the project. Usually if I'm working with a client and I know that they might want some revisions in uh, whether that's in the arrangement or whatever, I'll mix with MIDI because that allows me to tweak notes and things like that. But if, I, if I'm working for myself and I wanna save on computer resources, then I'll bounce everything to audio and then mix the audio. So it really depends on the situation for me. I do, a, I do, a, I do both. Darcy says, what is your approach to reverb? How do you combine two to three reverbs? How to EQ the reverbs and the length of the reverb tails? Great question, Darcy. Again, I like to keep things simple. I start with libraries that already have a great reverb in them, like, like baked into the samples. So the OT and Cine samples, um, those are my go-to instruments and Cinematic Studios as well. I find the Cinematic Studio stuff slightly dry, especially the strings. So what I do is I load up a, an auxiliary track with Spaces 2, choose the San Francisco Hall, and then I'll send specific instruments which are a little too dry to that setting. Um, I keep it on, I think it's like 80% wet by default or something, and the dry is zero. And then yeah, I'll just turn up the send up or down depending on how much of that I want. And then if it's still too dry, then I'll combine that with an algorithmic reverb like um, Valhalla Room, which has a wonderful sound. So that's my process, very simple. Anton has a few more questions here. Lots of good questions. Um, are you a full-time composer or is that more of a side hustle? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a side business right now. Um, I'm writing music really ma mainly for fun, but my main source of income is from teaching. How do you deal with writer's block in those days where the creative juices aren't flowing? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I wanna improve with this as well, but I think it's just mainly practice. And there's actually lots of things that you can do outside of actually composing music, I feel like. Um, well, at least for me personally, as a songwriter, I could work on writing lyrics. Um, I could work on making content. I could work on 
other things. But yeah, I typically don't like to force composition because if I'm not enjoying it, then the result is not going to be as good for me. And plus, I'm not I'm not working on film scoring, so I'm not on like tight deadlines all the time. Usually, the freelance gigs I have are arranging and orchestration, so those don't require much inspiration in terms of composition, right? But you know, arranging and orchestration is always fun because you're taking the original idea from other uh, original ideas from other people and arranging them in an original way that you hear, you know? So that's always fun. Salim says, why don't you use Spitfire? Uh, specifically the strings, thanks for your vids. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> so Spitfire, I, I've talked about this before, but yeah, I don't have any Spitfire stuff except for the labs and BBC Discover, the free stuff. But yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm already covered by Cinesamples and OT, so I've never really felt a need to um, to use their stuff and just plus like the the general approach with our marketing and everything it just it, it turns me off sometimes you know I I just you know it, it's not for everyone so that's the main reason why it's like East West and VSL and other companies like you just don't need to have everything you know it's good to have a selection that to, like, to choose from but if you watch my videos on like my top three string libraries or top two woodwind libraries or whatever you'll see how simple my setup actually is. And the more libraries you have, the easier it is to be overwhelmed by the amount of choices out there. So that's my personal reasoning. Um, so yes, Anton asks about work opportunities, uh, primarily from YouTube or other channels. Yeah, 100% of my work, like freelance work or orchestration or whatever has come from YouTube and um, building a YouTube channel. How important is it having a website? That's, that's important. Um, it is important, yeah. Yeah, it's important to be able to be reached really easily. And I have a website on Wix, ChristopherSue.com. Um, and yeah, just to being able to be found is super important. So not only having SoundCloud, but I think having YouTube and a website can be very important. <clears throat> Those are the only other places I use to promote myself and my work, aside from Facebook at times. But Hugo also asked, how old are you? Take a guess, how old do I look? I'm 25. Um, Johan asks, how often would you recommend composing and finishing pieces for beginners who want steady improvement? Great question. Um, for beginners, if you're just doing sketches of stuff, I would say try to do at least one piece per week. If you could do more, awesome. If you're talking about having a fully produced, mastered whatever uh, piece of music, then I would say one every two, we two weeks to once per month or one piece per month. So that's a, that's a good... Uh, starting point so then you'll have 12 completed pieces for the year and then e each time you produce you'll just find yourself improving quicker and quicker um, Anton asks how do you work on improving and getting better as a composer and understanding and utilizing your DAW to its fullest capacity so I'm a very simple person and I probably haven't even explored like I've probably only explored like two or three percent of what logic can actually do, but I just do what I need to do to get the job done. And I don't really don't worry about all the specific features, even though I probably should learn the key commands and all of that. Um, I, I just, I have a personal workflow that I stick to and that's what I do. But yeah, improving and getting better as a composer, I think you just have to listen. You really have to listen and critically analyze. So say, what do you enjoy about the melody of this piece? What do you enjoy harmonically? And then you really dive in and start to say like, what is actually happening? What kind of chords are they using? And if you're a keyboard player and if you know your theory, then that helps a lot. So I have specific videos talking about, you know, theory and breaking down pieces of music and you can watch those if you're interested, but that's what I do. Um, Luke says, I hear all these awesome compositions in my head, but I have trouble accurately writing out every part. Any tips? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Luke, you're welcome. Um, <clears throat> That's a really good question. I hear these compositions in my head, but I have trouble accurately writing out every part. Yeah. So there's a few approaches. You can either write out a sketch with the main ideas in there, and then you can create another sketch track. Um, and you can either load up an ensemble patch, or you can load up specific instruments that you want to do background textures or additional ear candy and start to play those in, in addition to your sketch track. It's like on top of it. You really have to find your workflow for that, I think. But the other alternative is to open a Word document and start writing down everything that you're hearing in your mind. So it's like you hear the main melody uh, being played by this. You hear the harmony um, and what kind of chords you want to use there. But then you can also write down like additional lines or additional counterpoint or whatever. 
and start saying, oh, at 30 seconds of the sketch track, I hear woodwinds playing a high run, or, you know, I hear the brass playing a big rip, soaring up or something, or I hear the cymbal doing a swell. There's lots of things you can actually do to get your ideas down without actually committing it to your DAW just yet. So you can either do that in the DAW or you can do it on a Word document or a notes app or however you like to put stuff down. Um, yeah, for me personally, as I'm working in the DAW, then I'll kind of listen back a few times and say like, okay, what else can I add in this moment? And then I'll decide on an instrument and then put that in. So that's how I work. Anton asks, how long do you spend writing a cue or a piece of music before deciding it's finished? Do you obsess over getting the sound just right in your DAW? And what if there is a deadline? Um, yeah, so usually I don't have deadlines at the moment. So I, I will work on it until I feel it's good, but I don't want to work on it too long or else I'll start to lose objectivity. So what I do is I work. If I, my ears are starting to get fatigued, I'll take a break, come back usually an hour or two later or the next day. And then once I'm pretty much happy with the arrangement, like I, my ear doesn't pick up on, oh, I could add this or this. Then I'll mix and master it. Usually that takes me a few hours and then I'll export it and that's it. So yeah, generally a piece takes me about a full like original piece takes me between 10 to 20 hours start to finish from idea to mix and master. Um, Tan Tan <laughs> says, uh, do you record or export the sound I output or have bad attenuation when listening to the laptop's built-in audio? Uh, sorry, Tan, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you mean there. Uh, but maybe, maybe you mean like bouncing to audio? Cause yeah, if you have if you have MIDI instruments that uh, sound a certain way, well, when you bounce it to audio, it, it would keep that original type of sound. But uh, maybe you can ask uh, ask in a comment in this video and, and maybe clarify what you're asking there. Sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, Kyer, I'm not gonna pronounce your whole name because I'm gonna butcher it, but says, I own a range of instruments from like Spitfire, Native Instruments, Cine Samples, whatever. Uh, one thing that one thing I need to come across is, are there great sounding, excuse me, are there great sounding strings which have a fast enough attack? It's as if there's a slight delay in the actual accent of string sounds. Yeah, I mean, something like that. Uh, a really simple fix is to layer in your string sample, <coughs> or excuse me, your sustain sample with um, a staccato sample or a short attack sample. So then you start your, um, you start your samples with a larger attack, right? So the other way is um, if, if your string samples come with those accented sustains, then definitely use those though, because those could definitely help you. But yeah, I think the simplest way is to just layer a staccato or a marcato or a hard articulation on top of that. Okay. Uh, Bekir asks, when did you get started into getting writing orchestral pieces? Um, I started at, I started in 2017, the end of 2017, I released my first piece uh, based on Super Mario Odyssey. Um, I think it was in November or December of 2017. So ever since then, I've written a handful of pieces and um, I've, I like to think that I've gotten better ever since. So um, I'm trying to learn more every day, you know, however possible, but yeah, that's, that's when I started. Okay, our final question, Anton asks, where do you look for inspiration when writing music? Do you listen to songs that you feel inspired by and then use that as a reference? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great thing to do is I would say try to listen to a handful of pieces that you feel inspired by or songs. And actually that that's it's funny like that's how I got started writing my new piece of music. Like I'm right I'm working on a new Disney course, right? And or um a new songwriting course based on like animation, you know, that type of thing. So um part of the course is me creating a piece, creating a song uh from scratch and the music comes from just all my years of listening to Disney songs and Pixar music and just ingraining the techniques that Alan Menken and other composers have used to um, like in those songs to make them sound the way they do. So as I'm writing, I personally use some of those devices naturally, right? And so if I'm if I'm sort of starting to lose inspiration a little bit, then I can always listen back to some of my favorites and maybe even some new ones. I'll look at the pop charts, I'll see what's on the top 40 and kind of listen to melodies and hooks and study the lyrics and um, see what goes from there. So yeah, it's, it's really difficult to just be in a rut and get out of it sometimes. But I think when you're in, when you listen to other music that you like and even new music that you haven't heard before, you start to come up with ideas that maybe you didn't have before. 
So yeah, that, that's definitely really important is to um, try to find music you like and then while the fire is burning, um, put some stuff down. It doesn't matter if it's like really good or really bad, as long as you're in the output mode, then um, that, that can create some really cool energy and results for you. Whew. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, I really appreciate your questions. If there's ones that you want me to dive in, into uh, further videos in the future, let me know because I'm definitely open to hearing your ideas for future content. Of course, it's like a collaborative effort for all of us, for me. Um, so yeah, I want to thank you again for watching this video, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you have any more questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll see what I can, uh, how, how I can answer them. So thank you very much and I'll catch you in the next video. Oh, before I forget, I should share with you one of my free guides, which is, I have in mind, um, the 10 steps to a clear orchestral sound. It's pretty much my flagship um, guide on just like 10 really essential tips on getting the best and the most out of your orchestral music. And so that's like, uh, it covers like arrangement topics, it covers uh, mixing, it covers um, instrument choices and ranges and all of that stuff um, that I think is really, really fundamental to understand in order to create a convincing orchestral mock-up and um, just write better orchestrations in general. So it's absolutely free. If you check the description box, it's the first link and it's it's yours to have to keep. And so thank you uh, very much for watching. Let me know if you, again, if you have any questions and I'll catch you in the next video. Take care everybody, bye-bye.